You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And this is the Watchathon of Rassilon. That is the podcast you are currently listening to. Today we're going to be talking about the fourth serial of the 19th season of Doctor Who, The Visitation, which consists of four episodes that aired from February 5th, 1982 to February 23rd, 1982. Two facts! I'm pretty sure I said February. Really weird just now. February. February. And I want to give a special shout out to Matt Golden for getting us these episodes. Hey, thanks, Matt. Golden! You can check him out at matthewgolden.net. And joining us today <coughs> is not my voice. I have lost it. But we have That's two guests. Great. Yeah, it's great for, for a, podcast. a podcast. Yeah. But we have two guests today. We have Brian Snape and Mike Gordon. Welcome back, you guys. Hey, thank you. Howdy. And what an episode. Uh, quite timely, too, isn't it? Mm, mm, yes. <laughs> yes. And for a story that deals with plague. We are currently in one. Yep. It uh, it was very eye opening in in terms of recent events. Uh, I now understand what's going on currently a lot better. So this is an educational episode of Doctor Who for you. Oh yes, very much so. Aren't they all though? That was the that was the mandate, right? It was like the educational family show. Exactly, especially the historical ones. They're always educational, and they're never inaccurate. Never. How have you guys been holding up during this uh, pandemic? Uh, well, as anybody, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, staying indoors and uh, keeping six feet from the TV. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? <laughs> Just watching a lot of things like Doctor Who and, and appearing on podcasts and chatting about it. I've, this is my fifth podcast this week. Whoa. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Uh, there were two on Monday, uh, one Tuesday, one Thursday, and then today. So you had Wednesday off. So that's good. I did. That was nice. So, um, and then uh, I just wish I got paid for it. But then again, I probably wouldn't be asked as much if I did. <laughs> uh, you get paid with our love and appreciation. Sure. That's all I need. Tony seems uh, offended that I offered up her love and appreciation. I mean, I wasn't consulted. <laughs> No, I just didn't think that it, it doesn't sound like a very a- appeasing uh, method of payment. Oh, yeah, that's true. Like, I wouldn't want that. Oh, well, then I shall not give you any lo- love or appreciation anymore. So, Brian, how are you doing? <laughs> that's kind of a loaded question. I mean, so far as this uh, whole plague end time stuff, I've been holding up pretty well. Really looking forward to meeting the Black Death and everything head on. Just, it's it's beautiful. I've been, you know out there in the world just you know taking taking charge i'm making a lot of this up no now i've been just dealing with it as best i can i had about two or three weeks where i was off work but then i got called back in because i work in the mental health field so i'm back uh working at uh at the the organization that i work for the recovery center in hamilton county so nice it sucks that you have to be in but it, there i saw that the thing you shared they're doing some cool stuff letting people have counseling access to that stuff from home yeah just to to correct it's not actually counseling it's peer support conversation oh what does that mean so basically we're a peer-run organization that means the people who are staffed over at the at the recovery center are people who have dealt with mental illness on some level so that they're able to lead by example to the members that we have who come in for the classes and everything that they you know can see somebody who has living you know as close as they can to their best life oh cool very cool that is very cool thank god you started with me because i'd hate to follow up on that <laughs> <laughs> so let's follow it up by talking about doctor who i was gonna say yeah i've been in my pajamas playing animal crossing i am currently no in my pajamas so <laughs> that's how that's going for me but yeah let's talk about uh the visitation or rats green guys and social distancing <laughs> 
I have called episode one COVID 17th century. Ah, well done. Well done. Pretty good. Pretty good. Because uh, it's it's the 17th century. <laughs> it's it's COVID 19, though. Yeah, but the 19th century would be misleading. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay? Yeah. You haven't thought this through, Joe. Well, to be fair, COVID-19 is called COVID-19 because of 2019, right? Is it? I believe so. I don't, I don't know. I believe it. the 19 means 2019. You know what? I could have said, what would it be, 1719? COVID-1719? No. No? No. It's, you're, you're stretching it even more. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just talk about the episode. So we start in the 17th century, where, uh... We stay in it for a long time before, like, we see the doctor. That's true. Like, we see it, we meet a whole family that's eventually going to be kind of they're gonna, not important. Yeah, they're gonna, they're all gonna die, so you don't have to remember any of these people. There's a, there's a, a woman who sees a meteor shower outside of the window. Elizabeth. So she goes to tell her grumpy father about this. Her drunk grumpy father. Uh, I actually know this guy... From two of my favorite movies, one of which people don't know about, but is very good, and it's called Brain Donors. And another one, which people know about, but they think it's bad, but they're wrong, which is Hudson Hawk. It's actually interesting seeing someone I recognized from something more modern, because we've been in a lot of the 60s and 70s, and I don't really know people from the 60s and 70s. I knew John Cleese, that was about it. And and now we're in the 80s, and I, I know about the 80s. Anyway, they play some games and chat a bit. Then their servant goes to get some food, I think? It's wine. He take he takes wine because he's delivering it to the drunkard. Then we see the POV of some creature that is growling, which is weird because we never hear them do that after this. Anyway, the servant sees it, screams, and he just chucks the wine right at the creature. It's tragic. Uh, and then there are some laser blasts. They shoot the they shoot the uh, servant. With the laser blasts. Those laser blasts look really cool too, because normally they just do like a overlay. They do like the pew pew, but they they do the little laser overlay, and then like when it hits, there are sparks. There's some practical effects paired with it, and it's nice. Yeah, there's like smoke and stuff too. Real good. Uh, then we see one of the things that is shooting at them, and it is the most beautiful android I have ever seen. Oh my gosh. It's magnificent. It's absolutely magnificent. It's bedazzled all to hell and back and just so fancy. It is a Bowie bot. <laughs> I love this thing so much. If you like this um, in the John Nathan Tur- Turner era, just wait. It's only going to get better for you. This cereal has the absolute best design and also maybe the absolute worst design in the same story. Let's go ahead and talk about it. Uh, there's an alien revealed later, and it is called a Terralyptal. It's it's bad. Yeah. It was uh, uh, actually the first use of animatronics on Doctor Who. Is that why the mouth looks so gross and bad? Yeah. Like, his lips flap, but nothing else. Sometimes you try something new and it, like, takes a time or two. Yeah, they all can't be fucking Henson, you know. Jesus Christ, they're on a they're on a BBC budget. It's just, you started me so high with the beautiful, beautiful robot. I wasn't prepared for that radical shift in my expectations. You guys just watched Kinda, so you can only go up from there. Right? Uh, the Terralyptal actually reminds me of this picture that I've seen going around on the internet of the the Michelangelo mask from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but, you know, it's falling apart. Yeah, it looks like a Muppet suit that's seen better days. I've actually seen a Muppet suit that's seen better days. Uh, in Alabama, there's this place called Unclaimed Baggage. That's not a Muppet suit. That's just a puppet. It's, a uh, Hoggle. Yeah, but it's seen better days. <laughs> They've actually restored him since the last time you've been. Yeah, uh, but now he kind of looks like he's had plastic surgery. Oh, man. Did they give a uh, hoggle Botox? They did. Oh, man. He's very shiny, but yeah, I guess he got lost in some luggage. That is how stuff ends up at unclaimed baggage. True. Man, there's just nothing else in set design or anything that's as fancy as that robot. 
It's hard to be as fancy as that robot. It's literally bejeweled. I did enjoy seeing the uh, 17th century family all together with shotguns. That was a great family moment that you don't usually see in Britain. So that was pretty cool, actually. There's nothing as fun as a family with guns. I I, I felt it was a very, very telling uh, tribute to America. (laughs) So we finally get to the doctor. We, We get to the TARDIS. And I feel like this is the first time in a very long time that it's uh, felt more serialized. Oh, because of the references to Kinda? Yeah, because the doctor is getting on to Adric for using the the mech suit that was in Kinda. And Tegan actually gets a moment where she gets to process some trauma. Yeah, she talks about her uh, PTSD from being possessed by the, uh, the, the Mara. So always very upsetting to me when shows where like a lot of bad things happen to a character. And they're never given a moment to process. Like, wow, that was all awful. And like a bunch of awful messed up shit happened to me. And I should probably go to therapy. Nobody yeah. ever goes to therapy. It's true. They should. They go should. to therapy. Everyone needs therapy. But yeah, it's nice to see it. It it feels like the show is getting more modern. It is. It's we're in the eighties now. Modern. Time has happened. Time has passed. <laughs> Well, about as modern as, you know, this series will be able to get. I mean, it's still very standalone, but it feels just a little bit more serialized. I mean, we used to have this a long while back when, like, a cliffhanger would lead into the next serial. And we had key to time. Yeah, but it's rare that it lingers this long. Usually it's just a a scene and then we move on. But, like, this was a bit more involved. Uh, also, there's a scene where Adric thinks Tegan doesn't like him, and the doctor says, Sometimes us humanoids try to disguise our true feelings. And he says it in a way that sounds like he's saying he hates Adric, but Adric doesn't pick up on this. See, I took it to mean that, you know, despite the way that Tegan treated Adric, that she actually did like him. I think that's the way it's supposed to be taken. But yeah, I I, th- I think in the context of it being Adric who says it. The dynamic of the Fifth Doctor with these three companions is very strange. The, the, the banter is almost downright annoying at times. It's a real challenge to be able to process and, and you know, have three companions in a story. Take in point the last one where, you know, one of them was pretty much non-existent for most of the story. But when they all are together, they just sort of are very loud. And (laughs) the fifth doctor is just kind of like really grumpy. Like for as young as he is and, you know, as as sort of nice as he looks, you wouldn't think that he's probably one of the grumpiest doctors, but he really comes across that way. And there's even a scene where you you can see he's, you know, he's like, Tegan! (gasps) You know, and has to hold himself back in order, you know, to keep from having an outburst. So, yeah. Because he was just that close to, to slapping Edric, I think, too. So And, like, I don't mind bickering because that can be fun. Like, the Doctor and Donna is a really fun dynamic. But it's like there's no sense of fun to it. It's not playful. It's just kind of aggressive. It's not fun. And also, like, the conflict isn't character-driven. It's not like people are butting heads just, like, because of who they are. Where, like, you know, this character thinks this way and this character thinks this way. And so they're having a natural conflict. It's more just like, we need conflict, so they're fighting. I think that's uh, particularly true of Adric, who seems to have drastically changed these past few serials. More because of needing conflict than because of character development. He's way more antagonistic and sexist. He's a real dick. In a way that I don't feel like he was before. I mean, he was kind of dumb before, but... Yeah, but not aggressively dumb. Or to to say he was useless, like he says in, in this story. He says that he's useless. Yeah, because he, he seems like he's a know-it-all. You've got one little kid who's a, a know-it-all. You've got Tegan who doesn't want to be there. She's like, she's like Donna would be in The Runaway Bride, but all the time. She never gets over it. Instead, she's just irritatingly, uh, you know, she all she wants to do is get out of there. And she second guesses the doctor all the time. I think Nissa is the only one that's that proves that she's competent, which going forward to this story is is pretty interesting. But um, she also doesn't get a whole lot to do. She's just there sometimes. 
I know. It's almost like she's too competent. It's like, oh, like in the last story, it's like, oh, we have to find an excuse because if Nissa was here, she'd be able to solve the whole thing. So in this one, they kind of do the same thing. They're kind of like, you know, later on, he gives her a mission and then she's pretty much gone for most of the story. I mean, she's not gone, gone. You do. There are, you know, a couple scenes of her, you know, working on this, uh, on the, on the device and all that. Yeah, that's, but that's it. They, we check in with her every once in a while and she's still working on it and check in with her. She's still working on it. Check in with her. She's still working on it. It's like, she's pretty much just like, get her out of the way so that we can have the other ones get into trouble and the doctor has to save them. Speaking of Tegan wanting to leave, that's what happens next. Uh, they're supposed to have landed at Heathrow. They landed there. Yeah, 300 years off, which is consistent with the Doctor. So, uh, he, they're 300 years off. This makes Tegan very upset, and then this makes the Doctor very upset at her for being upset. Very upsetting. Conflict! Yeah, just conflict. But he goes out to apologize to her, and uh, they smell sulfur and assume that gunpowder is being made. So they go to sort of track that down, and they get attacked by villagers. And we have like a little fight scene that happens little fight scene just a little fight scene i feel like this uh this episode has a lot has a has more fight scenes than i feel are typical in a doctor who serial i don't know yeah i do remember thinking this felt more like a a third doctor serial yeah i don't i don't see peter davison in action that often but uh yeah it's kind of cool to see him fight i agree like they're throwing people over their shoulders and everything it's they handle themselves pretty confidently and get away the following two scenes with adric I feel like possibly the worst acting he's ever done. I don't know. He he stops and he looks around and then he awkwardly delivers a line about having lost the TARDIS homing device. Then he takes a step and immediately falls over. <laughs> he trips over absolutely nothing. He pulls a Susan. I, I have not had much of a problem with Adric before the, like the past couple of episodes. And lately he's just been really getting on my nerves. I, I don't know if it's... if. If it's Adric or the writing or what, but like he just just seems worse lately. <laughs> He's a teenager. He's a teenager. You have to understand. You know they go through a lot of changes. Nobody understands Adric. But to make up for this, we get what is quite possibly one of the best characters, Richard Mace, Highwayman and Thespian, uh, introduces himself. He is. Hanging out in a tree. He is a very Robert Holmesian type of character. I love him very much. He reminded me a lot of uh, Milo Clancy. Oh, he's fantastic. He's just so dramatic. He, like, does this great thing where he'll, like, I don't know, he does things and he undersells things and oversells them all, all at once. I don't know. He overreacts and underreacts at the same time. It's very glorious. He'll just say these big, beautiful lines, but, like, so low-key at the same time it's 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 very nice i love him so much he has such a rich voice and good lines i mean it's he's delivering it well and it's written very well Um, which normally you either get one or the other (laughs) he takes them all to a barn and kind of fills them in about hey there's a bit of a plague going on and he says that he is just happy to have some conversation with people and then there's the longest almost awkward pause (laughs) Yeah, that's true. As Team Tardis proceeds to say nothing. <laughs> I like, though, the minute they say plague, you'll notice, and this is, uh, you know, a precursor to current events, everybody likes makes sure that they're at least six feet back from them. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And each other. You gotta, you gotta stay safe. Stay safe. Stay in a barn. Peter Davison's crew was the first one to practice social distancing. I get it. Um, they were way ahead of their time. Innovators. So uh, then he also tells them about the falling star, the meteor, and he, the doctor is interested in Mace's necklace. It, he later explains privately to Adric, so as not to have Mace over here, that it is in fact an alien bracelet. And they start looking for other alien artifacts, I guess, because they, he said that the, the bracelet is particularly strong, I guess. So they're going to look to see if there's anything more fragile, and if they find something that's alien and fragile but it's intact then it could mean there are survivors it means someone survived yeah which seems very no that totally checks out but okay he does that every time it's true every time every time look for something breakable in alien and if it's not broken there's aliens 
But Nissa found finds uh, a power pack. Some batteries. The batteries, and that's more fragile, and it's intact. So I guess. Well, here's the thing: Do they just leave them everywhere? Yeah, they follow like a trail of batteries. <laughs> Like, they're just pulling them out of remotes and chucking them behind them. A trail of batteries as if K-9 had been there. <laughs> it's like they're they're in a video game where they just walk around and it's just floating there and you pick it up. <laughs> I'm just imagining that. <laughs> That's the music. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And then it goes, when you pick it up. Pating. Pating, pating. There you go. And then the pterodactyl shows up, and it goes. Eh, eh. I, I could see this story pixelated into a great video game. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I can't wait to see that robot in eight bit. See? Yes. Uh, the doctor wants to meet the owners of the barn, though Mace is not down for this plan because he's a bad. He's a he's a thief, basically. They get there though, and no one answers the door. But they figure someone must be there because they almost got ran over. Well, he's a thief and he's been, like, living in their, their barn, barn and they yeah. don't know. But they figure someone must be there because they almost got ran over by the miller, I think is what we we learned, by a cart. So they're like, well, someone must be here, so let's break in. That's the polite thing to do. So last serial, we had a, a discussion about, it seems like the doctor in, uh, what was it, Fort of Doomsday. The doctor was like, I don't want to hang out with Adric and, and Nyssa. I just want to hang out with Tegan. Only Tegan. Only Tegan. And then in Kenda, he ditches Tegan to hang out with Adric. And we're like, is this serial? Is he going to ditch them and hang out with Nyssa? And that's exactly what he does right here. But he doesn't even give a reason either. They're kind of like, should we go with you? And the doctor is like, only Nyssa. Well, considering what was happening in the console room, that's the only one I'd want to hang out with either. I mean... Both of them were working his nerve. So I, I, it made total sense to me. Like, no, no, I want to go with the competent one. You guys stay out here in the front and we'll go, we'll go away. It seems like the doctor's worked out that he can only handle one of them at a time. The, the doctor and the writers. <laughs> Coincidentally enough. I, th I think like he's just been, the past few serials, he's just been like pegging them on a case by case basis and going, eh, not this one. Eh, not this one. Yeah, I mean... It's funny because it is like, you know, it's a function of how do we split them up so that we, it's easier. It's easier to tell a story with fewer people that, you know, that we have this TARDIS team that's so big. But at the same time, the way that they do it is always the doctor just being like, nope, only you. You come with me. You're the one who gets to, you're the one who gets to be my special boy for this episode. <laughs> You've been chosen. <laughs> So it just seems like the doctor's playing favorites. <laughs> and he is. They break into a window through the in the back. They don't break the window. They just open it. They find gunpowder and another power pack. So they're on the right track. And then the doctor finds a wall. And he's like, no. This, this wall, wall doesn't is make suspicious. Any sense. There should not be a wall here because of the way that layouts work, I guess. Uh, so he's like, I'm going to check that out. You go let everybody else in. So Nissa goes to let everyone else in. There's also a scene... Where uh, they're talking about, like, the battery packs and what they're for. And Tegan says, I bet it isn't transistor radios. Like, that's a joke. <laughs> she puts her hand on her hip and delivers it as if to an audience. It's not the only time she does it, this serial, either. Tegan is not the best actress sometimes. Sometimes. Not always. The, yeah, sometimes, sometimes she's Sometimes she's great. She's especially great when she's not being Tegan. You do have to remember that she's still experiencing the after effects of trauma. That's fair. She, in, in Kinda, her acting, like, kind of surprised me. When she was being the Mara? Yeah, yeah. And, like, how good it was. And then she would go back to being Tegan, and I was like, oh. Dreams are private! <laughs> oh, the memories come back from that one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they go back to the room uh, where the doctor is supposed to be. But he's not there. And uh, the android comes up, shuts the door behind him, and locks them in. And that's the cliffhanger. Oh no, they're locked uh, in a room with a mysterious wall. How will they get out? Uh, well, well, let's find out in episode two, which I have called The Android of Death. <laughs> All right. The doctor pokes his head through the wall. That's how we get out of this. It's not a real wall. It's just an illusion. Sorry, I'm wrestling a dog here. <laughs> oh no. Film it. We need bonus content. Okay. <laughs> It's going to be awfully hard trying to suplex him doing this. 
I, my money's on the dog anyway. So. Yeah. You could kick my ass, couldn't you, buddy? Yeah. My God. <laughs> my God. I, it sounds like he just won. <laughs> he keeps licking my face. Aww. So uh, they walk. They all walk through the wall. Mace is very understatedly impressed. Yeah, I think he's he's convinced that it's it's some kind of magic trick, and he, he wants to learn how to do it. <laughs> There's actually like a special effect here that I was actually really impressive. I'm not 100% certain how they did it because they all walk through the wall. You see them like walk through the wall and then he turns around when he pops out and touches the wall and he's like, huh, seems pretty solid. I don't know how you did it. And I was like, I don't know how they did it either. That's very seamless. I don't know if it was a cut or if they slid a wall. I don't know what they did, but it was... Was good. I didn't notice that. I I don't know. Maybe it was just one of those things that uh, that it just it's the way they cut it. It must be. I don't know. It was it was, it was impressive though. I was like, oh hey, it sold it. So they smell a weird gas, and the doctor says that it is basically alien gas, so that they can breathe. The aliens that he suspects are here. Then there's a whole scene where Tegan judges Mace for wanting to steal wine, because that's what he wants to do. To now that they're in like the wine cellar he's like give me that wine she's she's judging him and she's like that would be stealing with her hand on her hip as if she's talking to an audience (laughs) and he's like yes i'm a thief (laughs) we had a whole conversation you keep forgetting i don't have the morals (laughs) well he's also a thespian so he can at least be forgiven for being overly dramatic (laughs) not tegan though (laughs) so they find the device that puts out the gas which is like this big green thing it opens up at the top like it's the egg and alien or something uh, it looks like that but it also looks like um an air purifier i mean that's what it's doing which it just might have actually been just with green effects on it uh they also find some rats in cages that's not ominous not at all and uh while they're just all sort of looking around in the and mace is uh getting some wine he finds some wine and he gets some wine the android now dressed up like death, he has like a full cloak on and everything. I can't believe they designed this amazing bedazzled android, and then he now he has a fucking costume change. This thing is great, <laughs> <laughs> and it's really kind of a nice, nice German Bauhaus, you know, skull mask that he has too. He he just rocks whatever he's in, you know. <laughs> Fashion icon. I mean, it's the eighties, so you know you're half pop, half goth. <laughs> Perfect. That's it. That's the ideal. Like I said, Bowie bot. And he just sort of casually walks into the room while they're all just looking around and then shoots them. <laughs> he shoots both Tegan and Adric. They pass out. Uh, Nissa and Mace. I thought Mace, they were dead. We could have only hoped. That's not That's not yet for one of them. Wait, 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 wait. What are you, what are you saying? <laughs> I have heard that uh, Adric. What? What? Spoilers. Cover your ears. Okay, I'm covering my ears. <laughs> I've taken out my earbuds. I don't even know if you guys can get or are, are talking right now because I can't even hear the thing that you're saying. And you know, I can just you know just keep talking, and you guys will probably <laughs> keep talking, and you probably have said something you know what the spoiler is, and so I'm just gonna keep talking to waste my time so I can actually put my earbuds in, back in. And so, anyway, Adric dies. <gasps> oh, I f- <laughs> fuck. <laughs> uh, son of a Tony! You just <laughs> you ruined God. everything for him. Oh, uh. No, I timed it really poorly. I thought he was going to go back to Alzarius. I thought he was just going to stay the companion for the rest of the series. We just grow up with uh, Adric. You know, we get to see him through his teen years. To his twenties, his thirties. I don't know how old he is that. now. I think I think it's better if you know going in because it it won't hurt so much because you can actually enjoy. He's only in two more stories after this, so oh, I didn't know that. You can enjoy him while he's with us. Every moment that he's on the screen, you can really, really appreciate. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> yes, in case you were confused. <laughs> So Nyssa and Mace run away while the doctor tries to save Tegan and Adric. But then he gives up and just leaves. I thought that was really one of those, what the hell is he doing leaving his companions unconscious and just possibly to their death? Like, he, there was an effort 
but not much of one. I mean, I mean, I get, I get it, I get it, I get it. It's Tegan and Adric, but still. I, I think we've already established that he didn't want to be around them, so he's probably like good riddance. Just did enough to save face. <laughs> I tried. I checked a pulse. There was still a pulse. The doctor does not save them, but the android carries them away. Well, I think we only see him carrying Tegan, but I assume he carried Adric as well. Probably drug Adric by his foot. Face down, just... <laughs> uh, so the doctor says that uh, Mace's necklace is a bracelet and is a control device. It makes the aliens be able to control you. Well, Mace is like, I don't believe that. And like he, the doctor uses the device to like send out a little shock, electric shock. That's not little. That's yeah, pretty big. And uh, Mace is like, that's a very good magic trick. So he's still not buying all this, even though he just saw a really cool robot. Tegan and Adric are tied up onto a table and are questioned about the doctor. They don't even get their own table. Well, no. They're both tied up on the same table. Do you think you give luxuries to, like, prisoners? <laughs> I guess not. I want to go to Tony's prison. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Everybody Tony. gets their own separate torture table. <laughs> I, I'd vote for you. She's a benevolent dictator, which I should remind you is still a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> but they are questioned by the terror lift. Well, this is the first time we get to see him in all of his bad mouth glory. And uh, I should say, because we said that like he looks like a, a Muppet suit that has seen better days. He is supposed to have like crashed. Half of his face is messed up. On purpose. Well, they actually later say that that was from he, when he was in prison. He got burned in prison. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, they do say so, that. Uh, but yeah, he's got half his face is burnt off, and he look he looks kind of like a fish. But like, like if you, you know, made a Muppet suit out of a fish, then lit half of it on fire and put a bad animatronic on the inside. That's what he looks like. Yeah, it's very much a low budget Sid Marty Croft kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> HR Terrorleptal. <laughs> But the guy playing him does does well enough. Like, he delivers the lines. Yeah, I don't want to harp too much on how bad it looked, because, like we said, it was the first time they'd ever done it. Kudos for trying something new. It takes some time. <laughs> really, it's just the mouth that that bothers me. The rest yeah. of it's fine. Yeah, the design itself isn't so bad. The mouth is just... It's got that Elvis sneer. Very rubbery and fake looking. And it doesn't move enough. Sometimes it moves too much, though. It's just, it's not, never the right amount of movement. <laughs> Yeah. So he's uh, he's questioning Tegan and Adric, and Tegan he asks where the doctor is from, and Tegan says that she thinks the doctor is from Guildford. Uh, how would you react if I told you he wasn't from Guildford after all, but instead he's from uh, a planet called Gallifrey? Until recently, that is. Who knows where they're from now? Oh, right. Well, she says Guildford. I forgot that that happened. <laughs> Maybe the doctor is from Guildford after all. Maybe. There's a possibility. That, yeah. That's what it is. We've solved it. Chibnall. Well, you know, that's funny because Ford Prefect was an anti-Doctor Who character, so... Ah. Trivia. The fish guy does not like this response. The pterolipital. These these are lizards. They're not fish. Lizards. Yeah, I guess reptiles. Yes, they're reptilian. Looks like a fish to me. You made me pull out my incredulous tone. <laughs> How dare you. <laughs> How very dare you. I'm writing a letter, and it's going to be W. This reptile does not care for uh, Tegan's answer. And says, you are being a very stupid woman. To which she says, that isn't a very original observation. That line made me so sad. She just burnt herself. Yeah, I know. She just totally roasts herself. Oh, Dan, Tegan, I'm sorry. I mean, Eric Sayward really hates this character. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's something we should, we should maybe talk about. This is the first episode written by Eric Sayward, who uh, becomes script editor here. He wasn't at this point, but he becomes script editor, right? Oof, yep. And from what I've gathered, no one likes him. Ah, that's another podcast. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other podcast. I have heard some people say they don't like his when he's script editor, but they, that he's a better writer than he is a script editor, which is also something I've heard about, uh, Douglas Adams too. So, I mean, yeah, sure. Wow. Okay. Mentioning Eric, is he weird in the same breath as Douglas Adams? Mm, I, I got to call a penalty. On that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's probably fair. I don't know. I haven't gotten there. So, I mean, he never takes the blame for anything. That's kind of one of my, problems he always foisted everything on john nathan turner saying it was it was his fault so 
I, I come with prejudice. I already feel like I'm not going to like him just from the few things that I've heard. So, But not based on this, because this cereal is not bad. Yeah. So, spoilers for my final thoughts. Final thoughts. This cereal... Not bad. So the doctor is like, we need to st- we we need to stop this android somehow. Uh, I have a plan. Let's vibrate it to death. Works every time. Let's get it a really good massage. Let's tone up those loose muscles. He learned it from that one Cyberman that gave him a massage. Yeah, in Revenge of the Cybermen, which you were a guest on. Yes. I can't listen to you say Cyberman. Cyber what Cyberman? I pronounce it correctly. Cyberman. 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 Yeah, Cyberman. <laughs> wow. The Terraleptal activates all of the villagers' bracelets. He is now in control, uh, and he sends them to look for the Doctor, Nissa, and Mace. The Doctor, Nissa, and Mace find an escape pod, the the one that crash landed. That was the, the meteor. It wasn't a meteor. It was the ship. They go inside, and Mace is very surprised. He's like... Why is it bigger on the inside? Which is fantastic because it's such like a classic moment and a classic line. And it has nothing to do with the TARDIS. Yeah. It's just another ship and everyone's like, it's on the rest of it's underground. It's just crashed underground. It's not even a time dimensional thing. It's just like that ship in Claws of Access. Which Gons was a guest on as well. Man, we're hitting all my greatest hits. (laughs) Gons' greatest hits. Or episodes to avoid. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, I like Claws of Axos in this one. I'm not going to say anything about Revenge of the Cybermen. Men. Men. They decide they need to get more info about this thing from the TARDIS, but they start to head out and bump into the controlled villagers. And uh, Mace is like, I'm going to pretend that my guns aren't empty. I'll scare them off. I'll do a bluff. Uh, the doctor's like, that's dumb. Go inside. <laughs> But I love him so much. He's he's just already ready to ride or die with these guys. Yep. But I like that the, the one the tone of the of the doctor being like go inside is like an adult telling a child to go to their room. And two, his reaction is to just be like, "Okay. <laughs> okay, dad, I'm sorry." <laughs> also at the same time, Tegan and Adric have been put in a cell and they are uh figuring out how to escape from the cell, which uh, I'm trying to remember what it is that exactly. They, like, break the thing above the door. There's a, a window up there. Air, yeah, the airway. Tegan climbs through it and then goes to look for a key, comes back with a key, There's a and good... Adric is, like, already climbed out. He's like, I didn't have to do that? <laughs> There's a good line there where she's trying to break it, and Adric's like, let me do it, I'm stronger. And Tegan says, yeah, but you're not as determined as she breaks it. Yet again, it's just Adric thinking he's better than women and being wrong about it. So back at the uh, the skate pod, a villager shoots an arrow at them and it goes inside the ship. So the doc- doctor runs inside the ship, shuts the door, and all the villagers come to like bash- bang on the door. And then the doctor takes the arrow and somehow uses it to fiddle with a thing, an uh, electronic device, and it blows out uh, the back door hatch. I don't, I don't entirely understand what he did, but it works, and they get out. And ping, they're free. So the villagers check in with the Terraliptal to tell them that they got away. It's like a radio thing, but they're doing it with their mind, and they're not coming in very well. And the Terraliptal is very annoyed that they aren't better at communicating with their minds. Well, you know, what primitive minds they are. How do, how do they not know how to use these futuristic devices? What plebes? Oh, Mace has another great line where they, they're running through the forest and he just sits down and he's like, I'm afraid my frame was never designed for rapid acceleration. He says it and he rolls that R too. <laughs> it is a great line. Yes, he has a load of them in this. And you can you can tell Sayward does have a soft spot for Robert Holmes in creating a character like uh, Richard Mace. The only thing keeping it from being like a classic Robert Holmes type character is that he doesn't really have a... a usually the, they come in twos. It's usually a duo. And this guy's just by himself. Well, he's playing off the Doctor. Yeah. So in this situation, the Doctor is the other half of the duo. Which is not how it normally goes. But I'll allow it. I'll allow it. That's my hypothesis. So he's very tired and doesn't want to run anymore. So he's like, hey, let's steal a horse. That's stealing. He'll never learn. He'll just never learn. This reminds the doctor of the Miller who almost ran them over earlier. 
And he's like, well, let's go talk to him and, and maybe we can learn some stuff. And But he, this is when they split up. He sends Nyssa to the TARDIS to uh, go work on the vibrating plan. Operation Vibrate. Him and Mace are going to check out the Miller. So they get to the Miller. They're like, hey, Miller, what's going on? And the Miller says nothing. He literally d- will not talk to them. Uh, like, he doesn't even acknowledge them. So he wants to steal a horse because he's tired of walking. And so when they get to the house, there are horses in the stable. And he's just loving on it. And he's just like, you could carry me, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, you could. It's like Brian and his dog. Yeah. <laughs> I'd break that poor thing's back. <laughs> Just the fact that they, they give time to that beat, I appreciate. Mace is adorable. Meanwhile, Adric and Tegan get back to that window that, that the, they broke into and are going to break out of. Adric manages to get out, but Tegan is captured by that good, good android. And then back at the Miller's place, the Doctor and Mace are caught by villagers but they're not under the control of the pteroleptal they just think that the doctor and mace have the plague and for thinking that they have the plague they sure are pretty touchy about them i mean they're like all over them they don't know about social isolation until just now well apparently not how much the plague doesn't really play a part in the plot of this story it's a MacGuffin. there's no that it, it never factors in as like a fear or anything well except the plan was to release the rats as a plague yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but there's like no characters with the play. Well, no, that would bring the tone down, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Something like that would be a real bummer. I mean, you can have a plague time uh, episode without showing a plague person, plague plague sufferer, plague person. <laughs> oh, what the fuck is a plague person? <laughs> That's what they think the doctor and Mace are, uh, and then they're like, execute them, and the doctor says. Not again. It just was just great. It was great delivery. It's a good line. I liked it. And that's the cliffhanger. That's the end of episode two. We are now into episode three, which I have called the plague carriers. Or rats. Ah, <laughs> oh, rats. <laughs> oh man, that sounds like my epi- uh, my episode title for the last episode of the last serial, which I called Snakes Alive. <laughs> Snakes on an astral plane. <laughs> <laughs> That's way better. That is good. Thank you. So they're about to get their heads cut off by these uh, villagers. Scythed off. Oh, yes, because that sets up something glorious uh, that's going to happen. But um, another villager comes in, but this one is controlled by the Terraleptal. And he comes in and says, hey, don't. <laughs> Stop. And the doctor and mates are like, thank you, thank you. And he's like. But still, you know, put them in a cell or something. I'm not, like, rescuing you guys. Calm down. Uh, they get taken away. But my next note just says, uh, Nissa starts making a vibrator in her bedroom. Oh. Goodness. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. You, you, that's true. No lies there. I don't know why she has to do it in her bedroom either. Because she carries this huge piece of equipment, like, dragging it across the floor to get it into her bedroom. Oh, and we watch every second of it, too. We see her tidying up her room like, is this one's going to be a real doozy. I didn't know what she was doing exactly to begin with. I thought she was just decorating. She was just decorating. I was like, this is not the time to decorate, Nissa. She was moving the bed, arranging her doilies. I do think she moves it into her bedroom because she says she doesn't want to test it out in the console room. Oh, okay. But it's not like there's not just two rooms in the TARDIS. It's the only two rooms Nissa is allowed into. <laughs> Apparently so. Which is one more room than Edric is allowed into. <laughs> Edric has to sleep on the floor in the console room. <laughs> <laughs> so the Terraliptal puts one of those control bracelets on Tegan and puts her to work putting vials on a cart. Why, I wonder what those vials are. That's super plague. Spoilers. Jeez. Oh, I thought you were asking. It was it was a rhetorical question. Oh. And once again, Tegan goes under mind control. Oh man, she's gonna have some severe trauma. She just this just keeps happening to her. It keeps happening. You'd think so. But afterwards, when she's taken out of it, not really, she doesn't really show any effects at all. Maybe she'll talk about it for like two minutes at the beginning of the next episode. <laughs> That's it. So Adric uh, has 
has escaped and he gets to the TARDIS. And basically the next few scenes with him is just him being like, I want to go save the Doctor. And this would be like, no, don't. And they just do that a little bit. The, the, their scenes are largely uh, Back and forth filler. One of us dies. Yes, uh, yes, uh. So the Doctor and Mace fight their captors and take off their bracelets. Another little fight scene there. I believe they are still stuck in their cell. But the those those villagers that had were under control are no longer under control. But they are now freaking out because they were under control. They do have trauma. And they think that the Doctor and Mace are warlocks. All these villagers just keep having wrong impressions about these two. Think they have the plague, think they're warlocks. Just this just keeps being wrong about these two guys. It's 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 tragic how that happens to be misunderstood no one understands the doctor and mace then the greatest thing of all time happens the android dressed up like the death like the grim reaper busts in grabs their scythe and just starts running around and scares off all of the villagers oh so cool it was so great i loved it so much the second he got the scythe i was just cackling with glee that was a beautiful moment it's all too short though the the whole serial should have been them outrunning this android dressed as death but he gets the doctor and mace and takes them to the terraliptal which by the way the terraliptal does not have a name none of them do none of them do there's what four of them three of them there was four but one was killed at the beginning of the episode ah right right they don't have names. The, I don't think the android has a name. They're all just generic baddies. And you'll see the Terraleptals again. Or at least you'll see the mask again. Yeah, they do show up in New Who. Yeah, no, they don't show up in New Who. They, they show up in Trial of a Time Lord. Oh, well, they do show up in New Who as well. The Terraleptals? Yep. Okay. <laughs> if you say so. Not, like, by name, but... Uh... Yeah, they're they're also present on the Pandora Opens and uh, Time Heist. Oh yeah, that's right. I must admit, I did not remember that. I looked it up because this is the first time I'd seen them, so it was like, oh, have I seen them before? And then I looked, and I'm like, oh, I guess I have. I was speaking about the mask, but yeah, definitely you do see the Terraleptals again. So that uh, this is your first time having seen this serial? It's my first time, yeah. Our, ours too. <laughs> I'm the seasoned vet. <laughs> uh, you're the one who's just going to keep getting mad at us when we get things wrong. So, uh, also, we've been watching this. We've been talking about this serial. Three epi- we're three episodes in. As of we were watching it, I was like, I still don't know what the bad guys want. Like, they don't reveal what their, like, motivation is until, like, right around this time in episode three. So this whole thing, they're just sort of, they're the bad guys, and we don't know why. We know they do, they're doing stuff. Like, they have these vials, and, you know, they're shooting people and whatnot, but we don't know what they want. It's like a Bond movie. Until the until the beginning of the third act, or the end of the second act, where the where Bond finally meets up face-to-face with the bad, big bad, and he then goes into a big exposition of what his plan is. Which is, this, that's what this scene is, is the Doctor talks to the Terraliptal, and he's like, eh, I just want to take over Earth, but basically. You know, a little bit take over Earth, a little bit of genocide, you know, the good stuff. I do really like this scene, though, because it's really, you know, the Doctor tries to give them an out. He's like, I will take you guys wherever you want to go. Uh, there's no need for this. Uh, I will do that, I, you know, free of charge. You know, just get in the TARDIS. We can all get in the TARDIS. I don't have to take you back to, you know. Now, I, the Doctor lies all the time, so he probably would take them back to get reincarcerated. But, um, you know, he basically offers them an out. And they're like, nope, instead it's easier for us to just kill everybody on this planet and live here. Like, if I do that, I can just steal your TARDIS. And the Doctor is like, ah, shucks. It never works. And even with that option, I can steal your TARDIS, and yet still I want to kill everybody on this planet. Because <laughs> they're just working my nerve. Have you met humans? <laughs> <laughs> he's very frustrated with them. He's just like, damn it, they're just so stupid. He's not wrong. With their stupid mouths that work correctly? <laughs> uh, then another another great scene happens where Adric finally is like, you know what, I don't care. I'm gonna go look for the doctor. I don't care what you say, Nyssa. And then he steps outside and is immediately captured. <laughs> ambushed. <laughs> is immediately yeah. ambushed. Did, did he even get like 10 feet? I don't think so. That's perfect. That sums up Adric right there. Like, uh, if you don't know anything about Adric, that scene sums it up. That is the Adricest ever scene to ever Adric. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> so uh, back at the with the Terraleptal, he puts Mace in a bracelet, gets him under control, but not the Doctor because the Doctor is too intelligent. Yeah, he'd be able to get out of that no problem. So they just put him in handcuffs. Which there's a scene, a scene I really like because um, the Terraleptal keeps saying that humans are primitive and beneath him and blah blah blah. And then later he says that war is honorable. That's why he wants to do this, like, kill everybody thing. War is honorable. He's like, even humans think so. And uh, the doctor says, yeah, but you said the humans are primitive. So, rubber glue. (laughs) Double dumbass on you. What was his line? That wasn't an argument. That was a statement. (laughs) Yeah, I did like that line. (laughs) Oh, and then the scene happens. The doctor is left alone. He empties his pockets and he gets his sonic screwdriver and he's going to try to sonic his way out of his handcuffs but he is caught by the terraliptal who proceeds to destroy the sonic <gasps> screwdriver and the doctor says it feels like an old friend has died I, it hurt to see it's a big deal you won't see it again in the classic series you'll see a sonic lance but you won't see a sonic screwdriver yeah you don't see it again till uh the doctor who movie that makes me sad it tears will form more so than the loss of adric <laughs> The loss of Adric is its own bit of sadness. There's another death in this scene that I felt uh, just as upset about. about Not as the Sonic Screwdriver, but probably more so than Adric. So. Yes? Uh, well, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get there. What? It's in episode four. Um, the what, a, what a tease. It's a tease, yeah. It's like I gotta keep you interested. This is also when the Terraliptal explains that he has a bunch of super plague rats that he's going to release and kill everybody. And if the doctor tries to stop him, uh, the doctor will be killed by his own friends, Tegan and Mace. And the doctor's like, eh, they're just acquaintances. I only just met this one. He tries to talk Tegan out of opening the cage, but she starts to open the cage. That is the end of episode three. We are now into episode four, which I have called The Iron Man. The doctor zaps Mace with that uh, control bracelet thing, which has already been previously set up that it can do that. And it like fries him or whatever. And he fights Tegan and gets him to stop. And he asks Tegan, how do you feel now? And she says, groggy, sore and bad tempered. And he says, oh, almost your old self. (laughs) Wah, wah. Yeah, no trauma there. Despite the fight, the second adventure in a row, her mind has been violated. And yet she's just a little cranky. Now she's just used to it, I guess. They they ask how Mace is feeling, and he says he is a man of iron because he's been juiced up on that zap that he got. I love Mace so much. Uh, then he proceeds to pick the handcuffs, uh, the doctor's handcuffs, with a safety pin. Which he's very excited to see. That's, that's his thing. He likes doing immoral stuff like breaking handcuffs and whatnot right but he's never seen a safety pin before i think he just likes being useful oh we all do right yeah Yeah. no no (laughs) yeah if you're if there's like a there's like a threshold you don't want to be too useful that everyone's like bugging you i like getting in people's way specifically (laughs) yeah that sounds like you i love how he proves that he's way more useful than adric so he successfully picks the handcuffs and then proceeds to start working on the door with the safety pin But the doctor gets very impatient and decides to just straight up shoot it. Which he has like a little too much fun doing. He does does have kind of a prowess about him, doesn't he? He does that thing where he shoots it and he goes, (gasps) blows on the tip of it. Just realized I was in an audio podcast and you probably could not see me doing a finger gun and blowing on it. (laughs) Just here you go. It's just... Another instance where, uh, for those people who think that the doctor would never use a firearm, uh, he's more than comfortable with those. Uh, At least this time he's not using it on a living creature. Yet. Oh, no. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, yet. But I also think it's it's funny because, like, they get out through the door and the mace is like, I loosened it up with that safety pin. (laughs) So Nissa tests out her vibrator while wearing some very nice headphones. She looks very good in those headphones. She does. She's just listening to some some chill beats, you know? Leia-esque. And everything gets all vibe, like the whole room vibrates and stuff. The headset is an authentic uh, Beats by Rassilon. <laughs> <laughs> the, the doctor and everybody safety pin their way into the control room, and uh, the miller is there guarding it. And uh, they have to do a little tricksy thing. They hide behind some boxes that they pile up. 
And they're like, yoo-hoo. And he comes out to him, and then they push more boxes on top of him. And he falls down, and oh my gosh. Oh, golly. This was another educational experience for me. I had no idea that they had cardboard in the 17th century. <laughs> That's from the Terraleptals. Oh, they brought that, that future technology, that alien technology. Cardboard is an alien technology. We bring you the magic of corrugated paper. <laughs> That must have been so annoying for them. No wonder they hate humans. They got to Earth and they're like, we don't have anything to put things in. <laughs> we have to create cardboard for these guys. Jeez. <laughs> How are we supposed to move our stuff in? So they go into the control room and try to figure stuff out. They realize that the Terraleptal has uh, gone to London. Uh, the doctor disconnects the control panel, turning off the control over the villagers. So they're fine now. And uh, he says, well, since the te- I, I can find the Terraliftal's base. I'll find out where he's going because I'm smart. I can find it. Because I'm clever. And Tegan says, just like you found Heathrow? Burn. Oh, She's not going to let that go anytime soon. No, she never does. She is like, I have a grudge and you are going to ride down the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, meanwhile, Adric is still being held by the the villagers for some reason they should be free by now they just don't like him they just that's fair (laughs) the android of death shows up and scares them off and adric runs back to the tardis where he kind of proceeds to let the android into the tardis no that's nis that's nissa's that's nissa's doing that's true but like adric let it there and then nissa let it in adric was following it it was going to the tardis already because it was told by the terleptal to go get the tardis and to bring it there. Ah, uh, okay. You're just trying to blame him for stuff that's Look, not Look, I just even don't like fault. Adric. <laughs> no, it it would have been cool if it was Adric's masterful, brilliant plan to use himself as bait to attract the robot to chase him so that he could be destroyed by, by the vibrator. That is way too much competence. <laughs> right. Yeah. I yeah, that's just yeah, that's that's not what happened. That's Adric Revisionist Theory. Nissa comes out, waves, and all of a sudden, there's the robot right behind the TARDIS. Wouldn't Adric see the, the robot go behind the TARDIS? And instead of, like, standing there waving at Nissa as, like, an idiot, he would go, No, you stupid idiot, get back in the TARDIS! It's right there! He's just incompetent, really, no matter what he does. So the android gets inside, starts shooting the place up a bit, and then Nissa turns up the base... And uh, the android explodes. Tony and I were very sad because he's like, "Oh, it's such a loss." It is. He's just exploded. Like he's on fire. It's. N- it doesn't look good. It's it doesn't look good. It's a loss for the world of aesthetics. And it's n- ultimately, it's not the android's fault. I mean, that's the way he was programmed, right? They could have reprogrammed him for good. He could have been an awesome companion. Yeah, like a, like canine, like. I, I hope one day we get a robot companion, like a humanoid robot companion. I'm, I'm sure, sure that'll be great. Everyone will love him universally. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen. Uh, but also, not only were Tony and I sad about the destruction of this beautiful, beautiful android, Nissa is also sad because she, too, is like, what a beautiful creature. <laughs> Joe and I, when Nissa said that, Joe and I were like, yeah, Nissa gets it. <laughs> Nissa understands what we're about. Mace starts stocking up on weapons, steals everything from this manor, and uh, the TARDIS sort of almost appears. And sort of almost doesn't appear. The TARDIS acting as if it's actually being piloted by Adric. That's that's what he's capable of. Do you know, <laughs> the Doctor looks so disdainful, too, mm-hmm. when it finally shows up. He's like, wow, guys, do you just barely manage that, huh? The thing is, Adric has successfully flown it before in, like, Castrovalva and stuff. I wouldn't let Adric borrow my car. <laughs> well, the Doctor almost seems annoyed at, like, how long it took them. Yeah. Where he's like, nice of you guys to show up, finally. The way that he uh, Adric gets it to finally work, too, is he just bangs on the console, and then it Because that's it what the Doctor would do. Well, that's, that's what it happens when you leave the parking brake on. I love the line, what would the Doctor do? He'd probably get angry. <laughs> and it works. What does Nissa say? I told you to empathize, empathize, not criticize. The doctor does it too, though, because when they go to, they're trying to figure out where the Terraliptal base is, and they 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 transport there. The doctor bangs on the console as well, uh, console as well to get it to work. That's just how you make 
technology, do what you want. You Fonzie it. The way they find the Terraliftal base is the Doctor is basically like search, scanning for any sort of high-tech stuff that shouldn't be on the planet. And if he finds that, boom, that's where they are. Uh, and it works. They get there. Using an ancient map of EastEnders. Right? Why is it just like a drawn map? Well, it's supposed to look like 1666. Right. But also, it's the TARDIS's visualizer thing. It could look more advanced. No, no, it has to look the part. Otherwise, it'd be anachronistic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the Terraliptals are moving that gas device into this their base. And I really like the way that uh, these there's two rooms. The There's like the entry room, and then there's the... A room deeper in that the Terraliptals are in. The smoking the smoking lounge. <laughs> the smoking lounge from their uh, air purifier. That room <laughs> is like lit green. And the entry room is lit very red. It's so pretty. It's very pretty. It's moody. It's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but the doctor and them finally get out of the red room. Get into the green room. And the Terraliptal leader, he has a gun that looks like a tiny umbrella. He puts it down and he says, I don't want to fight. I want to talk. Get him! And then two other <laughs> Terraliptals jump him from behind. I like how they were hiding behind the door. Almost in plain sight. Like, I didn't realize they were hiding. And uh, a fight breaks out. I get another fight. And uh, a torch gets thrown in some hay. And stuff is catching on fire. Uh, I hate when that happens. Tegan gets a gun. I hate when that and happens. And starts hitting people with the gun. <laughs> instead of using the gun. <laughs> baseball bat <laughs> to be fair it's a rifle and i think it had already been fired i guess but, it's, but it is insane to watch a person do that <laughs> the terror level leader, leader's uh, gun falls into the hay and starts to overload and then they all rush out because it's overloading and the whole place explodes and uh, the doctor's like quick throw the plague vials into the fire to get rid of them i guess that's a good way to dispose of it and then the most disturbing thing happens we see the Terraliptal leader die, oh. which is he's on fire and like his face is like bubbling. There are bubbles and they pop. It blistered. And yeah. Goo inside the bubbles. But they're still getting the money's worth out of that animatronic mouth. That that thing goes until the end. That thing and that thing animatronically chews the scenery. Oh. <laughs> oh, it was so gross though. It was, ugh. It was very disturbing. But uh, the doctor's like, hey, he goes up to Mace and he's like, hey, I want to ditch these dodos. Do you want to come be my companion? I'm trying so hard to get rid of my other companion. <laughs> Mace is like, nah, I want to stay and fight this fight and I don't know. He wants to put out the fire. He wants to put out the fire. Which he can't. But uh, the doctor gives him the control panel piece that uh, he pulled out of the machine earlier. He gives it to him as a memento. And uh, I think it's Nissa who's like, won't that be like... Won't that confuse the archaeologists? And he's like, fuck them. Fuck archaeologists. <laughs> Get a real job. I'm Time Lord Victorious. <laughs> oh, that's nothing compared to what he does next. So they're inside the TARDIS. Everyone's like, hey, Doctor, why aren't we putting out the fire? And he's like, well, because I have my reasons. I think it'll be fine. Uh, and then we see a sign that says Pudding Lane, and I had no idea what that meant because I don't know anything. It refers to the Great Fire of London. I, I figured that out when I saw it on the he Wikipedia. He has since done some Googling. Actually, I think Chris Cherry told me. So <laughs> Pudding Lane was where the uh, Great Fire of London started. The Doctor, who is the, the main protector of Earth, who favors London and Britain exceptionally well, decides, you know what? I'm going to let it burn for four days and kill a lot of people and destroy a lot of property, and that'll be a good thing. Bye. See you now. Consistent. He did it in uh, the Romans as well. But at least he had, he was kind of torn about that. And this one, he just kind of says... He, like, chuckles as he says it. Yeah, he kind of is like, ah, ha, ha, they'll be fine. No, they won't be fine. Thousands of people will be dead, but, uh, you know. It makes for a good joke. And certainly if he had told the companions, they would have been like, what? We can't leave, like, you know. Because I didn't understand this, because I know little about history, apparently. <laughs> this reminded me a lot of that Dalek serial, where it's the, the was it the, the Mary, Mary Celeste? Celeste? I knew nothing about the Mary Celeste either, so I was like, I don't... We had to Google that one, too. We had to Google that one, too. So this is an educational program. This is. Yeah, we've learned a lot. Yes. Proud of you, you little 
shaver. I'm glad we've all learned things tonight. So <laughs> that's that's it. That's the end of the visitation. We're going to take a quick break. And we'll be back for some final thoughts. All right. Are you one of millions of people worldwide with compulsive geekiness, feeling isolated and alone? Do you wish there were people that understood the thoughts and feelings associated with Geeky Flare Up? There is hope and a treatment program that can help. Ask your podcast service or ESO network provider if the Nerd Bliss Podcast is right for you. Or go to nerdblisspodcast.com today. Side effects may include butt hurt, movie quotes, nostalgia, warp speed, becoming a clamp, becoming a brony, appreciation of cats in the movie, pity hose, asking God what he needs with a starship, donut muffin, or bagel, fat shoelaces, improved sense of rhythm, aiming to misbehave, nudity, and random arbitrary. Lists. And we're back. Tony, do you know what time it is? It is, let me just look here, 8.48 p.m. What Eastern time? Standard time. What, yes, what time is it in the podcast? I don't know. Uh, I, rec- I was going to tell you how long we've been recording for, but we've broken record several times, so I don't have access to that information. Okay, but like, what do we do at this point in the podcast? What is it time this for? bit. What do we do after this, after I get thoroughly annoyed at this bit? Oh, we do final thoughts. Yeah, it's time for final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, guess go first. Both of them. Yes, they have to do it in tandem. Okay, we'll give you a three, two, one countdown. <laughs> Michael, what we can do is we can we can do the the game of you know one of us says word, then the other one says a word, then the next one says word, so we complete the sentence. That could work. When you get to period, then person the next person has to start a new sentence. <laughs> You want to try it? Sure. Okay, cool. The period <laughs> of period this period is period of period monumental comma gusty period and exclamation mark. <laughs> Thank you. I was waiting for that. I just wanted us to end strong. <laughs> I appreciate. It. Oh, for for so I think now. So their final thoughts are over. Yeah. And now it's our turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I'm gonna let let let's let them do it separately. Okay. The one who's my favorite can go first. I'm not gonna say who it is. I'm gonna let them work that out. Well, Tony, you actually know me, so I know that's not even possible. <laughs> now I just feel like it turned into an episode of Thunderdome. <laughs> <laughs> can we get beyond thunderdome uh brian go first this is one of those stories that <clears throat> when it was shown on my public television station it was shown in an omnibus edition and i taped it off air uh, to listen to when i'd go to bed at night so i have fond memories of listening to this of you know hearing the soundtrack and imagining all the things going on in the story so the story kind of has that kind of resonance for me otherwise this is not terrible in terms of what's to come it's actually kind of a gripping story i like the uh, i like the terraleptals i think they could be uh, they were uh, good villains even though they weren't even though they were more bitchy than argu- and argumentative than evil but uh for the most part um I give it a uh, I give it a definite eight point five out of ten. Yeah, this is the first time I've I've seen this one. Um, I've seen maybe I don't know uh, half of the Peter Davison era, so so I'm getting caught up. So it was kind of nice to to fill in this one, and uh, I was I was impressed actually. It moved really fast. Uh, I didn't feel like it lagged like usually in some of these. You know, the, it feels like oh well, one of these episodes is just filler and all that, and it didn't feel that way. Uh, it felt like it moved pretty quickly. There's a lot of action, uh, some legitimate action of uh, folks fighting and all that. The villains are great. They don't look great, but they're the the guys behind the makeup and all that. Uh, I think did a pretty good job. Uh, Mace is a great character. I nominate a big finish series uh, for him if he's still like that. If we can still work that out, that would be awesome. So sometimes you run across campaign and like people that they you know the characters that could be good companions uh, are even better than the companions that the Doctor currently has. Uh, Richard Mace fills right in there uh, like i could i could see him being a better companion in some cases i like uh there's a lot of good moments in this for as far as a doctor who fan including the end of the sonic screwdriver era which is pretty amazing actually so i think that's significant that way ultimately I, i'd probably give this maybe a uh three and a half but maybe out of five i like how we're all gonna use different scales <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i think when Joe, when you and I were talking about this episode, I think you called it breezy, mm. which is like, it's 
pretty thin on plot, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not a slog. <laughs> right. So it's like, it's just, it's like a quick, fun serial that isn't doing a terrible amount, which is fine. It doesn't have to. But you have, you know, a really fun robot. You have a good comedic side character, somebody who's makes you kind of sad that they're a one-off character. Shoot, I don't have a whole lot of thoughts besides that. <laughs> Uh, I enjoyed it. What do you what do you rate, rate it? I don't I don't know how to give things ratings. I'll borrow from our burn notice podcast and I will give it two yogurts. So that leaves me. Yeah, I I enjoyed this serial. I didn't have uh, a bad time watching it. It was fun. It's not a super complicated plot or anything, but it moves along at a good pace. Like it's been a while since we've had like a pace that has or a serial that has such good pace. It just it moves when it it, it never drags except maybe when uh nissa's just working on her vibrator that's that's the only part that it kind of slows down <laughs> she's organizing her furniture like mm, this needs to be a little bit more to the left but uh yeah it's it's fun it's funny there's a lot of good dialogue not just from mace but from other characters as well mace is amazing though and uh, i love that android Ooh, i love that android i wish I wish the serial had maybe focused more on the android than the Terraliptals. I like the Terraliptals, but I love that android. Yeah, it's a shame that you have such a great design for this character that's not really important. And then you have, like, the, the main enemy who's not as fun to look at. Yeah, they maybe should have swapped it. Have the Terraliptal be the android, and he has these uh, reptilian minions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I liked it. It was it a... Was, uh, fun it was very easy to watch i enjoyed it i give it yellow out of cmyk oh wow that's strong so uh before we go uh is there anything you guys would like to plug let's start with mike i appreciate you guys having me on again this has been great fun as usual and uh yeah you can find me talking about doctor who stuff on earth station who uh, we've now gone to a uh we're recording every two weeks now where we're talking about some classic stories so who knows i may visit with the visitation again sometime soon but in the meantime uh, just check us out. Earth Station Who is located. Uh, you can find that on the ESO network. Uh, same place that you can find this podcast. Yay. And Brian, what do you got to plug? Uh, well, I could plug the podcast I haven't done in quite a while, which is Harry Sullivan is an imbecile. Adam and I are kind of uh, retooling it and trying to think of uh, some new topics that we can talk about. But uh, Adric is an imbecile. That's what I recommend. I mean, we don't want to be obvious. You know, welcome to the Water is Wet podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you can follow us on twitter at imbecile pod we will be uh recording hopefully shortly stay tuned to this space and thank you again for having me on the podcast i know i've been on quite a bit and i appreciate you guys having me on and tolerating my eccentricities anytime it's always fun when yeah. either one of you are on and it was a delight to have you guys together that sounded kind of sexual in a way i didn't mean it to. i feel like you meant it yeah i did a little bit Wink. Is there anything we need to plug? Oh, I want to say uh, Road Trippy, a book I co-wrote with Ray Friesen and Chris Cherry, is available on Amazon now, so please go buy that. It's uh, Road Trippy by J. Bartholomew Hivemind. Technically, it's pronounced Hivemind, but it's spelled Hivemind. And if you do like it, please leave a review on Amazon and Goodreads and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Tony, you, you have anything you want to plug? Uh, same old. Every episode of The Unseen World is available to watch on demand. So if you're running out of things to watch, give that a try. You can find it on the Roku, on the Heartland Network channel, or you could go to... WatchHeartlandTV.com. WatchHeartlandTV.com and search for The Unseen Worlds. Every episode's up there, and they're all good. Yeah. They're mostly good. A good chunk of them are pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) And if you like this episode of the podcast, you can check out more on WatchYourRassalon.com. And be sure to rate and comment on our iTunes. It does iTunes magic. Yeah, it helps us get seen and stuff or something. I don't entirely understand. Yeah, um, the more people leave reviews on your podcast, the more iTunes will like 
show your podcast to other people. So leave reviews for us. Leave reviews for Harry Sullivan as an imbecile. Leave reviews for Earth Station Who and Earth Station One and all the ESO Network shows. If you'd like Maybe to help. leave a review for Burn Notice Notice. Oh, Burn Notice Notice. Burn Noticed. No, just Burn Notice Okay, Notice. yes. No no reviews for Screw Burn Screw those Notice. guys. And if you'd like to help us out even more, you can go to watchyourasslon.com slash support. And there you'll find a link to our Patreon page, which you can also get to just by going to patreon.com slash watchathon. And there you can donate a monthly amount to get all kinds of rewards, like day early episodes, uncut video of the podcast records, live streams of us watching the episodes, bonus episodes, all sort of cool stuff. Also on our support page is a link to our Amazon wish list, where you can sponsor an episode of the podcast by purchasing the corresponding serial on DVD for us. We'll mention you on the podcast and put your name on our Friends of Rassilon page. Speaking of, special thanks again to Matt Golden for sponsoring this episode. Hey, thanks, Matt. Golden! You can check him out at matthewgolden.net. Uh, also want to give a special shout out to Vincent E.L. for providing us with our theme song. Thanks, Vince! You can check out their music at soundcloud.com slash Vincent E.L. Or maybe it's vincentel.bandcamp.com. Maybe it's both. Anyway, tune in next time when we talk about a two-parter, Black Orchid. Until next time, keep calm and wrestle on. Goodbye, and I love you in a platonic parasocial way. Bye. As always, my pleasure. What's the opposite of howdy? Adios. Yeehaw. I'm afraid my frame was never designed for rapid acceleration. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Thank you.